Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. You know, I'm a, I'm a big sports fan, and I think you've probably realized this by now, that sports has just been a big part of my life. And, and I played sports growing up in high school. I played, you know, football, I played basketball, I played soccer, and I just kind of played sports throughout my life. And I've just kind of grown up kind of just loving sports and watching sports. And what's, but what's so funny about me when it comes to sports is, is that all my favorite teams are from different cities, every single one. Like every single one of my teams is from a different city. So I'm an Edmonton Oilers fan, even though I'm from Calgary, right? It's weird, but it's the way it is. I'm an Edmonton Oilers fan from Calgary. But I'm also a Calgary Stampeders fan. Yeah. It's like, you should watch your team play, right? You know, they're not very good. <laughs> Boom, roasted. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm a Calgary Stampeders fan. And then the NBA, I'm a Denver Nuggets fan. And just this week, last week, they finally made it to the finals It's the first time in their team history. My favorite team. Whenever I tell people I'm a Denver Nuggets fan, they're like, why? Because they've always just been not very good, but they finally made it. And I'm also a Toronto Blue Jays fan in the MLB. And, but let's just be honest. My favorite team of any sport ever is the New England Patriots, okay? Now, if you don't know the New England Patriots, they're the best NFL team of all time. The best team of all time. They had a dynasty from 2001, 2018. Uh, it was one of the best of all time. But in that span, they won six Super Bowls. They won six championships in that span. And what's, what's interesting is that they, they just kept winning game games, and they were under the leadership of Coach Bill Belichick and quarterback Tom Brady. And these are the years I loved so watching them. I got to see greatness happen every Sunday. And when Tom Brady retires, when he did just retire, but he might come back, Tom Brady retired, he's going to go down as one of the greatest football players, uh, if not the greatest of all time. He's won seven Super Bowls, and he, he has the most passing yards in NFL history. His, his accolades and his longevity, all of that make him such a great athlete, one of the greatest athletes that we have ever seen. And what's interesting about our culture is that we love greatness, right? We love, we love, we love, we love, we love greatness. We want to know who's the greatest. We don't want to just know who's good. We want to know who's the greatest of all time. Maybe you've heard that saying before, the greatest of all time. We call them the goat, right? The greatest of all time. And we want to know who's the best. Who is it that was the best of all time? And what's interesting is that in our world, greatness is defined by results and performance and longevity. Right? It's how many wins you have. It's, it's how, much you, how much you sell. It's, like, like it's all about the accolades or the performance or the results that we have. Because again, in sports, we define it by how many wins a player has or how many championships or how their statistics compare to other, the, the other players. You know, great art is, is, is determined by the technique used and the ability to see things in a new and fresh way and see things before anyone else can see it. And you know, great employees are often those who are self-motivated, those who are productive and who are punctual and who are coachable, right? The great employees. You know, great businesses are those who have high profit margins and low turnover rate due to a great work culture. And they find creative solutions to meet the needs of their customers. But not only do we judge greatness, I think if we go down to the core of it, all of us want to be great. I think we have this, this ability, whether it's right or wrong, that we want to be great, right? We, we, right? we want to be great parents. We want to be great siblings. We want to be great bosses. We want to be great employees. We want to be great wherever we go. And it's interesting is that this is not just a debate, the goat, the, the greatest of all time, being great. This is not just a debate that's, that's new. This has been a debate. This has been a conversation that's been happening for a very long time. And in fact, Two times in the book of Luke, we see the disciples arguing about who is the greatest. Who is the greatest? And if we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. And Luke chapter 9 verse 46 says this. Then the disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest. What a conversation that they were having, right? Who among us is the greatest? Who has done the greatest things? Who has accomplished the most? 
And what's interesting about this is if you read through Luke, in Luke chapter 9, it starts when Jesus sends out the disciples to bring healing and to share the, the good news, to go into the world and bring healing and bring, the, like, just love to the world. And so you can imagine the disciples, they're coming out of this moment where they saw healings, they saw demons getting cast out, they probably saw miracles, and they're sitting there walking saying, who is the greatest? Which one of us can have had the best miracles over, over the last few weeks? I can imagine the fellas, they're sharing their stories. I can imagine Peter's like, I prayed for one guy. He couldn't even walk, and then boom, I prayed, and he started walking. I'm the greatest, right? I can imagine they're just having these conversations. You know, he, this is one guy, one of this, I was supposed to say, I saw this girl, he, he couldn't see, and, and her eyes were closed, and I prayed for her, and boom, her eyes were open, and she started to see the light, and she started to see colors, and she started to see shapes, and she started to see for the very first time in her life. Who is the greatest? And they have this argument, which is an argument I think a lot of us, we often have. Oftentimes it's with our siblings, or oftentimes it's with our, with our spouse about who's the greatest parent in our relationship, right? It's like, I did the dishes seven times today. It's like, that's a lot of dishes though. Who is the greatest? And then Jesus says this, and this is so fascinating. In verse 47, he says this, but Jesus knew their thoughts. So he brought a little child to his side. Then he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. This is a real paradigm shift. I think not just for them, but I think even for us and for our culture. Again, we define greatness by what we can accomplish. And really what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, do you know what's the greatest? Is those of you who are willing to become the least. Those of you who are willing to serve. Those of you who are willing to, to, to walk in love and humility, that's what makes the greatest people. It's not about what we accomplish. It's not what our bank account looks like. It's not about the house we live in. It's not about the cars that we drive. It's not about trying to impress people. The greatest of all time are those who are willing to humble themselves. You want to truly be great? It says, welcome little children. And what's interesting at the time, the children had the lowest status in society they had they, they had value it's not that they weren't valuable they just didn't have much status they didn't have a voice they they didn't weren't allowed to really say a lot of things you couldn't get anything from a child they didn't really have anything to offer you and being with them in some ways would have been a waste of time because at the time everyone was trying to to become great right similar to today and Jesus is saying yo if you want to be great welcome the people that can offer you nothing Welcome the people to, that aren't going to give you anything. Those are the people that you're just going to serve and you're not going to expect anything else in return. You know, Jesus isn't even saying that the child is great. What he's saying is that if you are willing to humble yourself and become like the least of these, unless you are willing to be with people who can't give you anything, you will not be great. It's so interesting that, 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 again, the disciples are having this argument. Who's the greatest? And I can imagine, them again, they're talking about all the miracles they'd seen. And Jesus is saying, it's not even about the miracles. It's about loving people. And if you're bringing miracles for the wrong motive, it's not as important as what, what I want to do in your life. I want to bring greatness to your life. We have to be willing to serve everyone, willing to love and not only welcoming people into our closest circle that will make you better, but welcoming people into your circle that you can make better. You know, life is more about, I think, what we can give than what we can get. It's about what we can give to each other. But what's happened in society is we've gotten so selfish, we've gotten so greedy, that we, all we think about is ourselves. And I think you've probably noticed this in our, in our society, in our culture. <coughs> Again, greatness in our world is defined by our results and our position. But I believe the greatness in the kingdom is, divine, is defined by how and who we serve. If you want to truly be great, it's about how well you love people and how well you serve people. 
So I have a couple of things I want to share with us today. And this is the first one is that true greatness is using your position to serve people. You know, if you, if you look around, there's a lot of titles that we throw around in business, at homes. We all have a title, right? I don't know what your title is. You know, your title might be father. Your title might be sister. Your title might be CEO. Your title might be pastor. Your title might be sibling. It might be parent. It might be father. It might be mother. It might be grandmother. We all have titles. But do you know what's, what I think is so true? Is that it's not your title that makes you great. It's what you do with your title. Your title gives you closer access to people. And the reality is, is that we have the ability to love people or hurt people. In Proverbs 18, 21, it talks about the power of what we say. The tongue can bring, can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. There's power in how we treat one another. There's power in what we say to one another. There's power in how we speak about one another. How many people in our world have been so hurt by the people they thought would be there because they didn't live up to the title? Do you know one thing I've realized in life is that it's a lot easier to become a father than to be a father. It's a lot more work to be a father. Becoming a father, that's the easy part. Living the life of a father is very different. And I've learned this, and oftentimes I've learned this the hard way. How many families in our world are going through life without a father? How many families are going through life without a mother? How many parents, how many people have been abandoned by the people that had the title, but they weren't living, willing to live up to the responsibility? Titles bring you more responsibility to serve and to give. That has to be our response when we have our title. So the question is, how do we practically serve and give from our position? Or how do we give from our title? And I think it starts with this verse right here, Philippians 2, 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble Thinking of others is better than yourself. This is exactly really what Jesus was saying. If you want to be great, don't be selfish. Don't try and impress others and be humble and think about others as better than yourselves. So I want to give us a couple ways that will help us learn to serve better, serve the people around us better, the people we lead better. And so the first one is find out who you lead. Who is it that you lead? It might be your family. It might be your kids. It might be your work. It might be your employees. Like it, it, we all have people that we have influence over in our lives. We all have people that we have a title over or even around us that we have the title. And it's time for us to find out who it is that we are actually sharing Jesus with. For me, I look around in my life, I'm leading my family, I'm leading our church, I'm, I'm leading our staff, I'm leading the people around me. Who is it that you lead? I think sometimes we don't actually realize the influence we have on the people around us because we've never actually thought about it or actually thought, okay, who is it that I'm actually leading? So that's number one. Number two is, is don't just find out uh, who you lead, but find out their needs and find out their desires and find out their hobbies. We have to actually get to know the people around us. You know, you might know that your coworker just had a child and rather than ask them, what do you need? It might just say, hey, I've got some meals for you and I, I want to bring them and I'm just going to drop them off. When's the best time? You might know that your spouse loves plants, like, like sunflowers. And you might come home with sunflower seeds. And then you might grow them and they might grow sideways. That's a true story. I'm being honest, Beth was so pumped. I don't know if I bought her these, but we got sunflower seeds. She planted them, and they were growing. Like, it was, like, awesome. Like, she was so pumped. She's like, finally, sunflower seeds. Literally, like, two weeks later, because they grow quick. All of a sudden, I'm not kidding you. They're literally growing like this, like, straight this way. And we're like, what did we do wrong? Have we never grown sunflowers before? So that's a true story. But you might know that your spouse loves plants, and it might be, you know, you might not like plants. They attract bugs. You might be like, that's, I'm going to be okay. 
and bring something that you know your spouse or your family or your kids or whatever, whatever they actually need. What do they actually love? Is there any people who love puzzles in the house today? I don't get it. I know people who get a puzzle that's just one color and there's no edge and they like find it fun. I'm like, I got enough to be anxious about. I got enough to be worried about. Like, don't be worried. Like, don't add more to your life to be worried about. Why puzzles? Beth loves puzzles. I don't get it. But do you know what I do know is I know she loves them. So sometimes I say, let's do a puzzle. And I don't last very long on the puzzle. I get very distracted. I'm like, can I watch my show while we do the puzzle, please? You know. You know, I, I think I've shared this before, but some of the best advice I ever heard, and it was about parenting, but it was if you want to be a good father, understand what your children love and learn to love it too. And I think that's in, in regards to every relationship we have. Is there's a lot of things that I love that you don't. You know, when I talk about the New England Patriots, you might be like, yeah, that's, I don't get that at all. You might be like, wow, you watched golf on Saturday. What a horrible way to spend your time, right? Like, but hey, I like it. But do you know what the people around you, do you know what your kids actually love? You know, I think sometimes we get so caught up in our relationships and we do this so subconsciously, we think that we can buy the love of our kids sometimes or buy the love of people when the reality is sometimes the kids just want you there. That's our last thing when it comes to this is be available. And my dad used to always say, love is spelled T-I-M-E, right? Time. When I was five years old, I was like, it doesn't, though. <laughs> Buy me an Xbox, bro. But do you know what I remember more than anything about my childhood is the moments where I was present with my family. The moments where my parents were busy, but they still made time for me. You know, as humans, we're busy, right? Like, think about your schedule right now. It's like, I don't even want to think about it. That's how busy some of us are. And sometimes what happens is that we've gotten so busy that we're no longer available. Are you available to people when they need you the most? It might be helping them move. It might be a shoulder to cry on. It might be a phone call to celebrate their promotion. Time is so important. And you know what I think the resource we waste the most of is time. And I think like the past like four weeks, I'm talking about how distracted and how much time we waste. Because I think it's just so prevalent right now. How much time is just wasted? Yeah, and I've heard people say, I'm so busy. But then they've finished Netflix. The whole thing. And I'm like, is that even possible? And they're like, I'm just so busy. But have you seen this new show? It's like, no. I, I, no, I haven't, right? We serve people by being available to them in crisis or celebration. Being available for people isn't always comfortable. And I'm sure you've recognized this in your life. You know, one issue that we face today is this thought that hurry and busyness and the hustle is success. We think the more busy we are, the more successful we will be perceived. And that might be true in our culture. But I truly believe that, that as followers of Jesus, busyness and hurry are what are destroying some of our most important relationships. And you hear businesses and churches, like we all say this, it's like the customer is the most important, right? We, we always see this. Like no business goes on their ad, like we don't care about you, we only want your money. No one says that in advertisements. Now it might be true, right? Like I don't know, like I don't know the, the heart of, this, of the ad, but no one ever says, you know, we don't care about our customers. But it's different from saying it than living it out, right? People have to be more valuable than our product. People have to be more valuable than our work. Maybe your work is helping people, and that's amazing. You know, for me, I normally do my message prep on Thursdays, just what I like to do. I like to spend a lot of time just in prayer and figuring out, like, God, what do you want to say to us as a church? Like, what are you speaking? Like, and I really like to spend some time in this. So what that means is that Thursdays to me have become very 
like, I don't want to say the word sacred, but like almost sacred. Like, like they're very important and it's the time I really make sure that I spend time and it's important to me. And one time a man in our church came to me and said, hey, I have an important meeting on Thursday. I would really like for you to be there for me. And I said, no, I, like unfortunately, like I, I'm prepping my message on Thursday. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I have too much going on and I just left this. I said, sorry, call me and tell me how it goes. This is what I said to him. I'm the pastor, right? Someone said this to me. And I woke up Thursday morning and I realized that people are so much more important. That yes, the message, of course, like I want to have a great message, but what's the message if we're not living it out? And so I, I called him and said, hey, I'm going to be there. It was an important meeting. It was heavy and there was like emotion. Like it was tough and I sat there with him. But, how, but I almost missed out. I almost missed out because my schedule was so much more important. We have to realize that the people around us, the people we lead, they're more important than what we do. To be available, to be present, to have, spend time with them. This is why Beth, uh, Jane and I, our daughter, she's almost three, we, go into, we do date night every Tuesday night. We do something random, we'll go to the park, we'll go to McDonald's because that's our favorite spot. We did date night every single week. Now, now I have two daughters and a, and a wife. I'm like, three dates a week? Count me in, right? Like McDonald's three times a week? I'm just joking. <laughs> if you know me, I just love McDonald's. Like it's, it's like kind of bad. You know, you might gain success, earthly success, by being busy, by being in a hurry, by having the hustle, by having the grind. and You might get it. But then I think eventually, and you see this so often, how many times do people look back and realize at what cost did they get it, right? So the second thing I want to share today about greatness is that true greatness is using your power to elevate people. Again, what makes people, someone powerful in our world? Think about it, okay? It's money. It's influence. It's the ability to meet somebody's needs. It's having a big voice, and you see this all on, on all over social media. Now we have the jobs where people's whole job is influencer. Like for real, like that's people's professions, and they make like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Influencers. That's what power is in our culture. And you know what's so unfortunate, and we're seeing this, is that I don't want to say most of the time, but I would argue to say almost most of the time, people in power use it to take advantage of other people. We see politicians and pastors and actors and athletes using their power to build their own fame and to go on elaborate vacations. And I'm not saying like, like you know, resting and all this is wrong i'm just saying like like so there's some of the most powerful people in our world are using their power and their influence for the wrong reason power is important but it's often misused and if you ever watched spider-man uncle ben he says this to to peter parker with great power comes great responsibility right and it's, it's such an interesting thing because really I think Jesus almost, echo, like this almost echoes Jesus by saying, hey, you might have the power, fellas, but what are you using it for? When you have the power, when you have the influence, we have to use it for the right reasons. I think we all want to be great. We, we have to use our greatness to influence people to be better, to meet the needs of the people around us. The greatest people elevate others, and the greatest people care about making other people better, not just themselves. And this is exactly what Jesus did. In my opinion, one of the things that made Jesus so great is summed up right here. And what makes God so great in Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, God sent Jesus. Jesus came to elevate us, to heal us, to restore us, to forgive us, to die for us, die in our place. 
take our sin and nail it to the cross. Like, he came. But I think oftentimes in our culture, that would not be considered great. You know what the greatest moment in history, two greatest moments, is Jesus giving his life for us on the cross and then coming back a few days later. A lot of the time, the cross, if you look at it, in a lot of eyes, especially at that time, it would have been looked at as a failure. Jesus' life on earth, they would have looked at it like he's gone. So much for greatness. But then a few days later, he came back. Greatest moments in history. Jesus is the greatest. We can become great by emulating his love and mirroring his grace and copying his joy and and bringing him wherever we go. You know, John Maxwell is an author, a leader. This is how he defines success. And I find this interesting. He says, success is when I add value to myself, but significance is when I add value to others. See, sometimes we get success and significance confused. We want to be successful. I think the reality is, let's not be successful. Let's be significant. Let's make other people better. That's how we become great. If we want to use our power to value, only to bring value to ourselves, we will be viewed as successful. How many, how many times are people are so successful, but you hear stories of how meaningless they feel life is? They have the money, they have everything that a lot of people desire, yet they look at back and they think, but where's the meaning in my life? Where's the significance in my life? We see this in actors and musicians and athletes. They have it all, yet they don't have purpose. They have the talent. They have the statistics. They have the championships. Here when they get to the end of their life, they think, man, I was living for nothing. They look back back at the closest people around them. There's barely anyone left. The greatest people that changed the world made other people better, not just themselves. Let's live our lives in dedication to making others better, to adding value to other people. When we lower ourselves below people, it allows us to use our influence, it allows us to use our title, allows us to use our position to push them forward, to bring them out of the pits, to bring them into deep relationships with Jesus. And later on in the book of Luke, we see this argument take place again, Luke 22, verse 24. Then they began to argue among themselves about who was the greatest among them. Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who, uh, those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. This is exactly what Jesus did, the greatest example of greatness in human history. Coming from from perfection to a broken world to serve us, to change us to restore us, to build a new creation within us. The one who deserved this royal entrance, who deserved the great feast, the one who deserved it all, he came to wash our feet. He came to heal our bodies and to die instead of us. See, Jesus had the title of God, but chose to walk in the responsibility of a servant. That's a thought that I think about I think about how many times have I misused my own titles, my own position. And I didn't even have that high of a title, God, right? It's like, I'm just like, I'm like, it's like father. And my hope and my, my, my greatest joy would be to raise my kids in a way that they know how much I love them, but more importantly, how much God loves them.
Jesus is the definition of greatness. His influence and his power, he used them to serve and to make us better, to make our world better. You want to enter the conversation on who's the greatest? Learn to be more like Jesus. I want to end with this story. It's from uh, John chapter 13. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and returned to God. Had given authority over everything. has the title. In verse 4, I love this. It says, so he got up. He got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. Now, I'd probably be here like, like Simon Peter. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Peter says, no, you will never wash my feet. <laughs> and then Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you, don't, you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, not just my feet. <laughs> this conversation is just so funny, but Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. And this is the part I really want to focus on, verse, 13, verse 12. It says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher, you call me Lord. And you were right, because that's what I am. And I, since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master. Nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. This is the moment, a very humble moment. Jesus takes the towel, takes the posture of a servant to love his disciples, serve his disciples in a way that they didn't understand as well as Peter didn't even want because he thought, no, like, like you're, you, you, I should be washing your feet. We have to learn again that our title, our position should be used to, to serve people. It's not your title that makes you great. It's what you do with it. We have to learn that the power that we have, that God has given us, should be used to elevate people, to add value to them, not to take value from them and just build ourselves. Selfishness destroys greatness. You want to be great? We do this by serving people well and elevating people above ourselves. Now, our takeaway today is, that, is this, is greatness doesn't come from our accomplishments or success. It comes from having a posture of a servant. That's the greatest among us is those of us who are willing to take the posture, the same posture Jesus took to serve one another. So I'm gonna, I wanna pray for us that we can start to step into this, this posture, to step into this moment of servanthood where we serve everyone, the people that we're around at work or at home or at church, we serve each other as best as we can. And we're not gonna get it right all the time. We're gonna mess it up. We're not perfect. But let us learn to serve and love one another better. So let's just pray together. God, we thank you that you did send Jesus to come and take the posture of a servant so we could learn to serve each other as well. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for everything that you've done. And God, help us become aware of some of the selfishness even in our own lives. Help us become aware of some of the things holding us back from actually being a person who serves well. 
So God, speak to us. Give us clean hands and give us, give us pure hearts as we go into the world, as we share your love, as we share your joy, as we share your peace. God, help us walk in the posture of, of a servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.